Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group Weekly Roundup for the training week ending August 9th, 2024. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, the theme this week is, is the market coming back or are we, uh, should we prepare for another rollover in the next week or two? Let's jump into the markets and just kind of get my take on where I see things shaping up here as we uh, go through the month of August into the Labor Day holiday weekend here in the uh, U.S. If we take a look at these markets, man, I tell you what, the bipolar nature of the markets were clearly evident this week. I mean, stocks closed slightly lower for the entire week, but that's after recovering from the biggest sell-off in nearly, nearly two years, really. The S&P neared correction territory um, down over, just which correction, of course, is over 10%. The SPX. Uh, was down about 9.71%, but the E-mini futures were actually intraday down 10.51%. They closed back up on the day, but officially intraday, the um, S&P futures did go into correction territory. Meanwhile, the NASDAQ is still in correction territory, is down 15.81% from its peak. But even more pronounced than these guys, was the uh, swings in VIX. Uh, that's Wall Street's fear gauge for most of you guys probably already know. It spiked Monday up to 65.73. That's the highest level we've seen since COVID crisis in March 2020. And then it fell back to end this week, uh, just a little over 20, 20.69. We did see some short covering, which, you know, the need to hedge bets that stocks would go down um, further. So there was a lot of short covering that helped move the markets back up to end this week. But a big part of this market overreaction this week was kind of a combination of high valuations uh, in AI and tech, a little bit of weaker summer market volatility, and then of course the reverse carry trade in the Japanese yen. As you guys know, I've been talking about the yen now for four months. Members, um, we set up trades. I know several of our members took trades in that, and it's it's kind of like the reverse. You're you're playing the reverse of the carry trade, whether you know it or not, because you're going long the yen and shorting the dollar. But for most that are playing just the currency market, you're going long the yen. You could also short the Nikkei as well, but long the yen is probably an easier trade for most people. Turned out to be a home run trade. Okay. Um, you can see on the screen here, everybody just barely in the red for the week after the crazy ass moves we had early in the week. The Russell was moved the biggest down 1.51%. Year to date, everybody is still in the green. You can see the PE ratio, the Ford is still, I think, a little bit overvalued at 5 or 21.92. 10 year Treasury moved up off the lows this past uh, week. It was down around 374, 375, so it moved up to close out the week at 3.94. Earnings yield still a robust 4.58%. Okay. Current VIX, again, finishing the week around 20.37. Uh, last week is at 23.39, so it's down about a little over 12%, almost 13% for the week. Um, <clears throat> you can see the best sectors for the week was industrial up 1.23, worse was materials, really taking a bath there. Utilities is still leading the way annually, which is a risk off sector. It's kind of like the uh, equity markets version of bonds. And then discretionary leading the way year to date down 2.07%. Now we're getting a lot of earnings this past week. A lot of major companies reported signs of a weakening consumer demand. And it's really important in the US because consumer demands about 70% of the GDP. We had Airbnb, Marriott, Hilton, Delta, United, Disney, all of these guys reporting softer travel demand. And then Yum Brands, the big food uh, uh, purveyor, slow, uh, showed slow in sales in KFC and Pizza Hut franchises. Uh, we did, on a brighter note, did get some ISM backed back up or bounced up rather from, it was being in a contraction territory in June of 48.8. It moved back up to 51.4. Um, and we got a little bit of a reassuring drop in weekly jobless claims on Thursday that it helped move the market, settle the markets a little bit, move it up. The S&P scoring its best daily gain since um, 2022 on that day. Weekly jobless claims had, had fallen to about 233,000. Um, and that was from an upwardly revised 250,000. So that wasn't that bad. Okay. Meanwhile, the three month average uh, new jobs um, in the, uh, is about 170,000. 
Uh, it's hard to look at it month to month because we've got a lot of volatility out there in these jobs numbers. But the three month average is about 170,000. So that's around the pre pandemic level. OK, so and, you know, these fears of a weakening labor market, because we did see um, unemployment move from 4.1 to 4.3 percent. That also set a little bit of fear in the markets earlier this week. Um, but we that caused the 20 year uh, Treasury. Um, to uh, roll over the beginning of the week, but then again, it moved back up. And then that really started, you know, you started hearing the course of uh, a lot of people um, on these uh, business channels saying that the feds have to cut their rates in September by 50 basis points. I think that's um, where everybody is right now. And then there's another 50 basis point rate cut before the end of the year. That would give us 425 uh, uh, bips for the year or 50 in September. And then the next meeting is November and December. Uh, there's not a meeting in October. I don't think we're going to cut that many. I think at best we may have two rate cuts. I'm not in the camp of a 50 basis point rate cut either in September, but it depends on where we get the economic data coming up. I mean, it, it really depends on where this stuff flows. Okay? If we look across the pond and we look at Europe, you can see kind of a mixed bag Euro stocks barely in the green. Same with the CAC 40 and the DAX and the FTSE barely in the red. All right. Um, retail sales volume over in Europe declined a little bit, 30 basis points year over year. And um, while it increased um, uh, 10 basis points the prior month. And in Germany, we got industrial output. It rose in June 1.4%. And we saw industrial orders increase a little bit, 3.9% uh, on a year over year basis. So I remember, Germany drives the engine over in Europe but still relatively slow compared to where it should be, okay? And then of course, if we look at the Asian markets, <clears throat> you can see the Nikkei, which really was one of the major drivers of the rollover uh, on Monday, uh, really ugly. I mean, the Japanese stocks, you can see for the week, they were only down 2.31%. Year to date, they're still in the green. But on Monday, they had the most severe one-day sell-off since, I think, Black Monday in 1987. They fell over 12.4%. That's what jacked the uh, VIX, the fear gauge, up dramatically. The, it forced a huge unwinding in the carry trade. So for those of our members that were along the end, did really well. I've been touting that for the past four months. Um, but that was driven by a rebounding yen on the, bank of, uh, uh, Jap on the back of Bank of Japan's hawkish turn really at its July meeting where they raised interest rates and detailed plans to taper their bond purchases. Now, remember, the reason why it's such a big deal, even though they raised rates 25 basis points, it really set the world aflutter because they've been putting stimulus into that economy for decades. And everybody was borrowing the in and then using that money to buy uh, mega cap tech and other higher risk assets that were making money. And then everybody had to reverse that trade when the Bank of Japan started raising the rates, right? Because now you got to pay back your loan in a much richer yen and a cheaper dollar. So it compounds the loss that you had. So it forced a lot of um, big money that plays that carry trade internationally to get out of that trade. So that really upset the markets on the Monday and Tuesday. It kind of got the game rolling. Japan, in fact, had to come out during the week and soothe the uh, markets where uh, the uh, deputy governor, the Bank of Japan deputy governor, uh, Uchida, basically said that the central bank's not going to raise rates anymore in an unstable environment. So that kind of reduced the likelihood of a near-term hike, another hike, I guess. So the yen settled back in a little bit. But you can bet. <clears throat> Remember, currencies, as I tell our members, tend to trend for a long period of time. Right? Day-to-day, uh, -day you could flip a coin up and down, but they tend to trend. So I believe the yen is going to continue to move higher over the course of the next 12 months. Now, if we go over to China, you can see China was also in the red uh, for the week and for the year. Hang Sen just barely in the green, both weekly and year to date. But the Chinese stocks, um, <clears throat> their consumer prices failed to offset concerns about their deflationary pressures. The CPI rose 50 basis points in July. All right. Uh, and it rose 20 basis points in June. Uh, and we did get a better than forecasted uh, rise in services activity to 52.1. That's expansion instead of contraction. But they're still facing huge uneven growth with their property slump. 
um, and uh, consumer consumption, right? Imports exceeded forecast, rising 7.2% from a year earlier, and that was up from a 2.3% decline in June. So just huge swings in imports and exports. Now, exports rose lower than expected, 7%. So there's still a lot of chop in China. But we like to look at China, South Korea, and Japan for their exports to see just how much buying consumers are doing across Europe and the U.S. Um, and it is slowing down. All right. So we got to pay really close attention to this. What I'm going to do is switch the screen over and let's look at the E-mini S&P 500 futures. Uh, let's just get this going here like this. Uh, where am I? Here we go right here. So let's get you over to that screen. Uh, and this, the, what you're going to see here is a daily chart and it's going to take about uh, 10 seconds to come up on your screen. Okay. But what you're going to see here is this big move down that we've seen. You can see intraday uh, from the peak of 57.21, actually it should say 25 instead of 12, down to the trough down here of 51.20, 601 points roughly, give or take some pennies. So we were down over 10.5% intraday, and that was that hard down day on uh, the 5th of August. Okay. Um, now, after that uh, down day, which was really, really an ugly, ugly day, you could see it tried to rally and came back down, but did not take out those lows. And then we got a couple of big green up candles. OK, and I will remind you that 5331 is a key level. I do believe we're going to probably run up kiss the 50 EMA, and then we're going to probably have a little bit more trouble. This pattern would suggest a little bit of a rollover, okay? I mean, if I were to just kind of map it out, what, what the higher probability says, it's one of these kind of moves like this, right? And then we come down, and then we make a new low, and then we start to consolidate before we start working our way back up again. This is a higher prob move, right? This would be an Elliott Wave 4 up here, and then a capitulation Elliott Wave 5 down there, and then we consolidate with ABC patterns, and then we look to move higher um, as we move um through um, September and October. And then we're just going to be more risk coming into October, November, uh, and then another possible rollover, possibly taking out these lows right here. Okay. At least this low, this is a defined low that we know already. So this second half of the year, I believe is going to look a lot, lot different from the first half of this year. Okay. I mean, it's just going to be a whole lot of difference. Um, now, <clears throat> Let me just, I got to turn my pen and it accidentally did the screen. Uh, here, let's go back here again. All right, so that's what I'm looking at for the E-minis. If we come up here and if we look at the um, NASDAQ 100 futures, this is the one that's still in correction territory. You can see here, intraday, now the NASDAQ 100 futures, about 48% of it is the mega cap, the mag seven. So they really got crushed. But you can see here, intraday down 17.31% almost a bear market, not quite. And then if I were to just draw a plumb line from right about here to where we closed on Friday, you can see that we're still down in correction territory of a little over 11.27%, okay? You could see where the 200 EMA started to hold us up that intraday, believe it or not, we almost barely by just a couple of percentage points moved into the red intraday uh, on the 5th of August. Right. That was that ugly day. And then, as, as you can see, we moved just a little bit lower. And then Thursday and Friday, we recovered almost all of our losses for the week. Almost, you know, uh, not quite. NASDAQ finished down about 0.18 percent for the week. Again, we're sandwiched between the 200 and the 50 EMA. So the 50 EMA to me is going to be a target. Same pattern. Um, the higher probability of a rollover after we run a little bit higher. So I think you're going to see some people repositioning and taking advantage of this move higher. OK, uh, we'll see how that plays itself out. Now, if we come over here and look at the FANG index, you know, this would be Microsoft, Meta, Apple, Google, Amazon. I've left out NVIDIA um, in, in this thing and Tesla. You can see the FANG index more so than the NQs was down intraday 18.18%. Uh, actually moved below 
the 200 EMA, but then that was intraday, and now we've just had a really strong move back up. It spent Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday moving back up, right? We closed that gap from the prior week. Uh, we're just slightly below the 50 EMA. Uh, you can see the MACD is running flat. You can see the volume here uh, on this move lower, how the volume picked up, and then on this move higher, volume fell back off the table again. So there's not as much conviction in that. And if we just come back, and let me just put the E-minis back on, and I'll show you the volume here too. Um, uh, let's see here. I don't know why I don't have the... All right, well, I guess it's not showing as well on this one right here uh, on the volume. Um, but just, yeah, it's not really showing here very well, so it got a little bit skewed. Let me let me move back over, see if I can get a better picture on the Dow. Uh, if we look at the Dow, yeah, same thing on the Dow. So if we come over here and look, the Dow intraday was down only 7.16%. And it makes sense because it's 30 of the largest, more, more value-oriented companies, but still sandwiched between the 50 and the 200 EMA, okay? Uh, and then finally, if we look at the Russell, the Russell um, fared the worst for the week. You can see here, it actually moved in the red. Year to, it was in the red intraday. Actually, it closed on Wednesday. It was in the red. Then Thursday, it opened in the red and then moved up and closed back in the green, but just barely. Uh, but again, same between the 200 and the 50 EMA. Intraday, the Russell was down 14.12%, all right? Not quite as bad as NASDAQ or the FANG index, but ugly. And if we look at the equal weight, just to kind of see how everybody else was doing, you could see the equal weight, like the Dow, was down about 6.45% year to date. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, it was down 6.45% from the highs, right, uh, uh, up here. So, you know, not as bad in either the Dow or the equal weight of the value. That was a place to be. Now, is this going to stay like this or are we going to see money pour in? I think money is going to be very cautious moving forward. That's what I believe. And of course, if we look at the Dow, this is just, in, I mean, the VIX, this is a crazy uh, number here. If you look at the VIX, look at the uh, look at that spike higher. I mean, it was up here. Um, yeah, let me just mark it on the screen here. It was right up in that area, right up there, 65.73. That was the spike. And then it came all the way back down here again, okay? And again, this is a daily chart. And you can see here, big spikes down to close on Friday. It's going to have a hard time getting back down into this yellow zone, okay? And that yellow zone typically is a choppy market zone. Markets in correction are in here. And then once we get up in this area here, down fast, you know, and then you could see here it actually moved into almost a black swan event up here if ball would have stayed up there. It did not um, because it was like an anomaly uh, and markets quickly settled in. OK, but just to show you how crazy that got, it was insane. OK, um, and then, of course, if we come down here and look at the bond market, you can see the bond market. Um, on that day, we moved back up, made new highs for the year, which meant interest rates made new lows in the 30-year bond, and then it's moving back down here again. So we're back into the red for the year, but you could see this, this ascending triangle right here. I pointed this out to you last week. We got the dash line here and the higher low line here, and I said the risk of a breakout is upside, not downside. And then, boy, we broke out and just took off. I think it's going to settle in around this number right here. But I think eventually the longer term bonds are going to go down and you're going to see interest. You're going to see buyers of bonds start to come back in longer term. OK, members, we'll go through that in more detail this Sunday evening for our, our weekly market watch. And then, of course, if we come down here and look at currencies, um, if we look at the euro, you can see the euro and the dollar were bouncing around all over the place. Really hard to trade. Um, here was Monday and Tuesday. You could see risk came into the uh, euro uh, on the 5th when the U.S. markets hit its lows, the euro was hitting its highs. So just put that away on your sticky note. The euro, if the U.S. markets start to get ugly, the euro is going to be a nice place to be, right? And then as the euro, Europe, I mean, as U.S. was recovering, the euro came back down. That is a bull flag that would suggest the euro is going to move back higher again. OK. And then, of course, if we look at the dollar, it's going to be just the opposite. You're going to see here um, when we hit our lows on uh, March 5th, the dollar was also in the lows. And now it's moved up here. But that looks like a bull trap. 
which means more than likely it's going to roll back over again and go back down. And then we look at my favorite, the yen. At the yen, as you can see right here, I was promoting this going long, be long the yen, and away we went right here. And these are key levels, key resistance levels up above. That was a resistance zone that I mapped out for our members. Um, I told our members, those that did not take the trade, don't just jump in yet because now you've made a big move. The low-hanging fruit trade was down here. Now it's made its move. It's going to settle in a little bit, and I think eventually it's going to go back higher again. When the um, uh, Bank of Japan uh, Deputy Governor Uchida came out and made that statement, kind of dovish comments about they're not going to raise rates or do any more mon monetary tightening, um, until the markets calm down, that just kind of moved the end down just a little bit. But I guarantee you, well, there's nothing guaranteed, but I do believe longer term, the end is going to be even higher than this. Okay. So it's a little bit about um, the yen. And then, of course, if we come down here and look at gold, I'm one of those that believe gold is going to slowly roll over here as we go into remaining parts of August, September, October. And it's going to come down and hit this gap right down here this from anywhere from this shaded zone to this gap it's going to take out the 50 ema you can see where it's held up here it's going to come down take it out and then i'm going to want to be a buyer down here because you can see the 200 ema it's going to be around that area and that's what i believe if we look at silver it is a lot weaker than gold it's down below both the 50 um, and it was below the 200, now it's sandwiched in the middle, but you can see the 50 EMA has got a downward vector, the 200's got a flat vector, so until it gets back up over the 50 and we see it hold, much like over here and over here back in uh, April, then um, I'm not going to want to play that to the long side, right? I think longer term they're moving up, but near term, no. If we look at our favorite energy, well, oil, you would think with the turmoil over in the Middle East, oil would be a lot higher than this, but this tells me that there's a lot of oil supply, which outstrips demand, which tells me the global markets are slowing down, and any roll higher here, you can see the 50 move below the 200, that's a, the death cross, that's what it's called technically, uh, means we could probably run up here and then roll right back down again. We were almost in the red year to date uh, on August 5th on that huge down day, right, in the markets. So. You can see where the asset class is right now. It's kind of bounced up, but I do believe we may roll back over again, much like the equity markets after a few days of settling in. So you have to be very careful. Of course, then if we look at nat gas, nat gas, we already had our uh, low hanging fruit trade over here, just like the yen. In fact, I was comparing the two. I said, you got to be long nat gas over here and away we went. We had some members make a ton of money on that. Um, and then we got a signal to sell right up at this area here, and then away we went down here. I wouldn't touch nat gas right at this area here. You've got a, it's, it's easy odds of moving higher as you do lower. So it's almost like a 50-50 split on where it's going to go. I don't like those trades, especially in the commodity market. I like to take it where it's too stretched to the upside or the downside. Then the risk is in your favor for a bigger move in your directional bias. Right now, not so. All right, everybody, that's just kind of a real quick and dirty of this crazy uh, bipolar week that we had. Members, I'll see you Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. Everybody else, if you're not in, I highly encourage you to come in and join us. We're having fun this year. I think the second half of this year is going to be a little bit different than the first half. Going to be a lot more chop. Volatility events are going to be popping up, and it's going to give us opportunities here. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Members, I'll see you Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. Take care, folks. Ciao now.